Old North End is the most densely populated neighborhood in Burlington. And it's also the most diverse, both racially and economically. It's about 0.8 square miles in all, north of Pearl, west of Willard. The neighborhood does bump right up onto the downtown, and also Jason on the west side to the waterfront. The Old North End, at the time we moved in, had the reputation as the worst neighborhood in all of Vermont. Now this neighborhood is the neighborhood to live in. What's really, in a way, exciting is how different everybody is. It's a melting pot. I love the culture and the community. There's a lot of fun stuff to do around here. And the school that I wanted my kids to go to was another huge draw for me to come into the one. Burlington, Vermont is a city with a lot to offer. It has good schools, access to quality local food, outdoor recreation, a vibrant art scene, and low crime. It's walkable. Home of a major university, its economy supports a variety of good jobs. But like many communities that have enjoyed economic growth and an improved quality of life, it has also become more expensive. It's really expensive. I have a full-time job and a couple of part-time jobs, and so we're just scraping by to make ends meet. The problem with housing in America that makes it so difficult to afford a decent home is really the escalation in the price of housing. Housing markets are not really functioning for working families. There is literally no state in the country currently where a family that earns minimum wage can afford even the rent on a two-bedroom apartment. Burlington has fought hard to keep housing affordable in neighborhoods like the Old North End. Local organizations like the Champlain Housing Trust, or CHT, have preserved a substantial amount of housing for low-income families. It's incredibly hard right now for anyone to find housing. I feel incredibly lucky to be living in a CHT co-op at the moment because it is the most affordable possible route anyone could go right now. Burlington's Old North End has always been an immigrant receiving area, starting in the late 19th century with Eastern European immigrants. And the Old North End also had, as was the custom then, factories and workplaces right in the neighborhood adjacent to housing built for workers, so it was never well built. We've had people coming in over and over again, working class folks. It was an inexpensive place to buy, and it was where the workers lived. Then around the 60s or 70s, all their kids and they moved out. And all of a sudden, we had a vacancy. The neighborhoods went into decline. A lot of the waterfront was owned by railroad companies, which were now headquartered in Canada. And the city was negotiating with them. There would have been a highway going across the waterfront around the city, as well as high-rise condominium was the sort of development that they envisioned. And I saw these plans in the planning office. And folks were speculating on these properties, trading properties, they were just changing hands, people were making money. And so this put our tenants in a very, very vulnerable position. You had the university students coming down the hill from the east, you had the prospect of luxury condominiums and gentrification pressures from the west, and an expanding central business district. So all of that was putting extreme pressure on the, uh, the families and the affordable housing here in the Old North End. In 1980, a young progressive named Bernie Sanders announced he would run for mayor of Burlington. Good evening. My name is Bernard Sanders. We are going to be looking at poverty in Vermont, the economic misery, totally unnecessary in my view, that is grinding down the lives of tens of thousands of Vermonters. Sanders, who would go on to become senator and eventually run for president, was an unknown figure at the time and considered a long shot for mayor. He stunned the political establishment with an upset victory by the narrowest of margins. 
When Bernie was elected mayor, a big engine of that support came from housing advocates around the city and residents of Burlington's Old North End. One of the issues that Bernie ran on was the waterfront's not for sale, we shouldn't have 20-story condominiums for rich people on the waterfront. His first couple of years were pretty tough sledding. It was seen as a fluke because he only won by 10 votes. People were freaked out. The socialists got elected in Burlington, and the council just decided they were going to block him. They would not let him even hire a secretary. We just took time in this first couple of years for Bernie to build any kind of support. But, you know, he perseveres. Two years later, he won pretty handedly. And then his supporters began to win on the city council as well. So it became really solidified pretty quickly after a year or two. There was a resolution that was passed for the creation of a new department that focuses on economic development and community development housing. The new department would be called the Community and Economic Development Office, or CEDO. And really it gave Bernie as a mayor a certain amount of power and authority to move projects along. This had never existed. The idea of having a community development office that reported to the mayor, this was a big win. Once that was passed, he hired the staff. Bernie put Peter Clavel in charge of community development. John Davis was an assistant director for housing. Michael was community development director. I was hired as housing director. That department really became the policy engine. The key part was housing policy. With rents skyrocketing, with the value of housing skyrocketing, 20 years from today, a home that was affordable will no longer be affordable. Bernie established a policy, this is very critical early on, that any funds that the city spent on housing would go only to permanently affordable housing. Permanently affordable. Permanently affordable. Permanently affordable housing. How do we keep housing affordable? This was a sea change. This was a big battle with the council, and it upset a lot of people. Most federal funding for housing goes to private developers, and they get more benefit in the end than the residents that get to use it along the way, because they get the asset. All the other affordable housing programs typically provide a term-limited affordability, affordability that goes away after a certain period of time. And if you go to places which didn't have that policy, they are losing affordable housing as quickly as they're building it. You can't build your way out of the affordable housing problem if the public dollars you invest leak out the bottom as fast as you're pouring it into the top. We need to plug the holes in the leaky bucket and capture that investment so that it's permanent. And sometimes it costs a little bit more at the beginning, but then it gets sold and reused and recycled, and it's always there. If we are going to maintain the vitality of the community, we're going to have to continue to come up with innovative ideas. We can't stand still. We were seeking solutions that would address how do we help renters in our city? And how do we help the old North End where they're concentrated? And Bernie looks at us and says, I'm looking for some new ideas. I need some new ideas. Terry Baricious, one of the early city councilors who was a progressive, discovered in his research this model of the community land trust. The community land trust would preserve housing as permanently affordable. And we thought, seeing the speculation that was happening in the Old North End, this model seemed to really fit and suit the goals. The origin of the community land trust is actually rooted in the civil rights movement. There were protests in southwest Georgia in the late 1960s African Americans demanding equal rights. And there was retaliation from the white community that took the form of evicting black sharecroppers from their farms and homes. And so leaders of the civil rights movement purchased a large tract of land and started an organization called New Communities Incorporated. And that was the very first community land trust in the United States. New communities had grand plans for creating affordable housing and other community services. But the organization faced fierce opposition from the white community and was denied funding by discriminatory government agencies and lenders. In 1985, the land was foreclosed. 
It would take more than two decades for new communities to acquire funding to continue its mission. But the idea of community-owned land took root, eventually making its way to Burlington, Vermont. When the Community Economic Development Office was created, uh, Clavel and others said, we should do the community land trust idea. A community land trust is a really unique model of land tenure, separating ownership of the land from ownership of a structure on top of that land. Having a nonprofit entity, the community land trust, own that land in perpetuity and sell the home on top of that land at an affordable price to a low moderate income buyer. Because the homeowner is only paying for the house, but not the land, the purchase price is significantly lower than a market rate property would be. As time passes, the property appreciates. There are two components to the increasing value of a home. One are the capital improvements you make, and secondly is the appreciation that's caused by the surrounding community. When moving out, homeowners are compensated for structural improvements on the building, and any increase in the value of land is divided between the homeowner and the land trust by a predetermined formula. Formulas vary among different community land trusts, but they're all designed to balance the ongoing affordability of the property with a fair return to the homeowner. It is not a zero equity model, it is a limited equity model, and you're walking away with a significant return on your investment. It was certainly slightly more complicated than Bernie's idea, uh, which is why don't we just give everybody $5,000 to go and buy a home? We said you could do that, but once you give somebody $5,000, they're gonna walk away with that. They're gonna be able to turn that home into a more expensive home in the future. And eventually the people of the old North End would find themselves displaced and not being able to live there. He was pretty quickly convinced that that balance between community and home ownership was the right balance. One of many solutions, and one solution that we have been working on, is the concept of a community land trust. We always saw the Burlington Community Land Trust as the cornerstone of our housing policy, but we recognized from the very beginning that it was going to be one piece of the puzzle. In Burlington, we have said there is a housing crisis. We don't know how we can solve it. We know that it's very expensive, but we're going to do the best that we can. We need a nonprofit housing delivery system that can work in partnership with the municipality. While the Community Land Trust was enabling home ownership in Burlington, CEDO established another nonprofit to serve low income renters the Lake Champlain Housing Development Corporation. Lake Champlain Housing ultimately merged into Burlington Community Land Trust, and that's why today we're called Champlain Housing Trust. Other nonprofits provided housing for different vulnerable populations. Cathedral Square served the elderly. The Committee on Temporary Shelter served the homeless. And the Howard Center served those with mental illnesses. People always ask us, how do we get this funded in the beginning? Because obviously, it was starting up in a time of reduction of resources. What can a city do? Okay, given the reality that the federal government has told us that housing is not one of their priorities. How do we leverage city money? How do we put pressure on the banks? The city pension fund put a million dollars up for working capital so we could act in the market and acquire these buildings and then a local bank matched that. We created a housing trust fund. We went to the voters and we said we would like to increase the tax rate by a penny. A penny for affordable housing. They voted yes. And then the state of Vermont followed suit and they created a housing and conservation trust fund. So at the state level, you had the equivalent to our housing trust fund at the city level. We are the junkyard dogs of affordable housing provision. Any scrap that was still left on the federal table, we use that money. We have secured not one, but two housing development grants. Bernie used to say, I come out every Monday and have a press conference about how we're losing federal money and programs for the city. And then 
every Wednesday, Peter Clavell has a press conference saying some new grant that they got and something we're doing for the neighborhood. So CETA was very successful at securing funds. In addition to raising funds and supporting nonprofits, the Sanders administration was also pushing legislation designed to protect renters and prevent displacement. We enacted, first of all, an anti-discrimination ordinance. We passed a security deposit ordinance. We brought just cause eviction to the voters, and it was rejected. We enacted an anti-speculation tax that was approved by Burlington's voters, but the legislature denied it. We did a complete overhaul of our minimum housing code. We passed a condo conversion ordinance. We passed a housing replacement ordinance so that vulnerable renters were not displaced in a conversion situation. It is not going to solve the problem by any means, but it will give us some tools to protect tenants who have right to live in affordable housing. You know, we finally enacted inclusionary zoning after three tries. I think it's appropriate for the local community to say to the private development people, if you want to build expensive housing, go for it. But you know what? X percentage of the housing that you build has got to be affordable as well. Okay, and that's a concept called inclusionary zoning. I'm sorry, that was a long, long <laughs> litany of things that we were, we were trying to do. The Shet Plain Housing Trust is the largest community land trust in the United States. Today, they have just over 600 units of affordable home ownership in their portfolio, and nearly four times that in terms of multifamily rental units. That, in terms of scale, is unmatched uh, by other community land trust organizations uh, across the country. Over the last two years, between Corona Relief Funds and ARPA funds, more money than God <laughs> has been flowing uh, into the state. That's been good. We have literally hundreds of apartments that are coming online over the next year or two. So we're gonna have a major bump in terms of impact in the market. I think the need is gonna be still greater than that, just because those pressures have been intense as well. They've just been really intense. We've protected a sizable number of units they are scattered throughout the Old North End. But once you get off those islands of affordability, the displacement pressures are pretty extreme. A truly overheated market can't be stopped. You know, you don't stop the rising sea. But what you can do is to create some bulwarks, some islands of affordability to make sure that the most vulnerable people are not displaced. I am living in a three-bedroom townhouse in the Bright Street Co-op. At the time that I was looking at the CHT properties, it was definitely the most appealing because it was the most affordable. I can't spend all of my money on rent. CHT really is gold for somebody in my situation. I couldn't have done it without their help. Yeah, check it out. You should save one for your portfolio. I have been teaching art at Rock Point School for 22 years. In the summertime, I organize an annual event called The Ramble, which is the celebration of creativity and community for the Old North End. So this is an Ethiopian Eritrean food, and I enjoy cooking fitting all these people. Hopefully a lot of people is coming today. The idea of the ramble was like, the old northern gets a bum rap. Why are we always the underdog in like the city's story, you know? Let's just all do our cool thing on the same day and we'll make a map and tell people. And you just kind of like meander around. I'm from Iraq. It's been almost nine years now I'm in Vermont. First, when I came to America, it's everything different. But now, no, I'm at home. So this is the Ramble, and you're here. And I really want to appreciate all the vendors. Thank you so much. I came to Burlington in like 91 after a rainbow gathering in Vermont and just found that I loved the city. I run right now a thrift store called Junk Teaks, called a drift store. It's more of like a art, art 
exhibits constantly changing and expressing right. itself. I am a um, Boston refugee and I lived in Germany um, as a refugee for eight years and then um, we were tolerated guests in Germany so we had to leave at some point. We decided to come here because there was a already established Boston community. I'm from Kenya, been here 14 years. I'm living in a rental house right now uh, but my goal is to eventually have my own place. Never had any restaurants here 10, 12 years ago, not a one. Now we've got dozens. Never had any of these small supermarkets. Never had nice parks, now we've got them. So it made this big transition from being an island to being an island with a lot of bridges, which is wonderful. It's all these people swirling around each other. They're very different from each other. I think that's an awesome place to live. So now I live in a, people call it a CHT house. Champlain Housing Trust owns the land. I own the house. What do you think would have happened if you hadn't found a CHT home? Oh my God, I can't even imagine. Well, I probably wouldn't have been able to live in Burlington, honestly. Or maybe I would have had a different career that was more focused on money. Like when people say, oh, you have a home base, like you're putting down roots. Uh, it's like, it's really hard to put into words how that feels and what that enables you to do. You know, I think about just different, very fulfilling things I pursued because I don't have to worry about where I live. It's just very hard to put into words.